happy Sabbath and happy International Women's Day of Prayer. It's International Women's Day of Prayer, and so we're talking about prayer together this morning. In 2008, um, I was a student missionary at um, the University of Michigan through a missionary training program that is hosted by the Michigan Conference. Um, and as a missionary on campus, a lot of what we did was friendship evangelism. And that involved making friends with students, getting close to them, really just befriending them. And through that friendship, using that as a means to share with them the love and the grace of Jesus. By God's grace, one of the students that we ministered to that year made the decision to get baptized. And I will never forget at his baptism how his mother stood up with tears in her eyes and she talked about how for more than 10 years she had prayed for this day. That for more than 10 years, morning, every morning, every night, she had prayed that her son, who had wanted to ha have nothing to do with God, would come back to the faith. And she was in tears, says, more than 10 years I've been praying for this day. Prayer is power. We live in a world of sin, where we are burdened by grief, by sickness, by pain. And in our seasons of sickness and pain and grief, we need God to move on our behalf. And God bids us bring our burdens to him in prayer. Like this mother who prayed for more than 10 years for her son, she brought that burden to God in prayer. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, the Bible says, this is Jesus speaking, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus invites us to bring our burdens to him because they are too heavy for us to carry on our own. Prayer is an essential part of a Christian's life. It is essential to our life as breathing is for physical life. Ellen White writes, prayer is a necessity, for it is the life of the soul. Family prayer, public prayer, all have their place, but it is secret communion with God that sustains the soul life. Secret communion with God that sustains the soul life. As much as we pray publicly together here, it is in the secret communion with God that we find strength. Martin Luther, the great reformer, concurred, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. And so we just reflect, church, that God gives us the privilege of coming to him individually in prayer and unburdening our hearts before him. Ellen White describes it this way. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not that it is necessary to make known to God what we are, but to enable us to receive him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to him. While on earth, Jesus treasured the power of prayer. The Gospels record numerous occasions where he spent many nights and mornings alone communing with God. We read, for example, in Matthew um, 14, verse 23, that after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. And Luke records one of those days, Jesus went to a mountainside to pray and spent the night in prayer to God. And Mark records very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Church, we find God the Son in his humanity supplicating the throne of heaven. We find him early morning, late at night, seeking space and time to be alone with his Father. Because in his humanity, he needed prayer to strengthen him for his mission on earth. 
And if Jesus needed that recharge, how much more do we need it? Prayer is power. And prayer can ignite our spiritual lives, our church, and our community. And this morning, in this two-part sermon, we're going to be sharing four ways that prayer can ignite our lives. I'll share with you the first two, and Kathy Ann will conclude our message with the last two. Point number one, prayer ignites change. Prayer ignites change. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The Bible tells us here, friends, the old is gone, the new is here. When you and I come to Jesus, we are called to live in newness of life, to walk in newness of life. But we know that we don't do that in our own strength because the battles that we fight are not physical, they are spiritual. And prayer is our lifeline to fighting those battles. You know, the question has been asked throughout history of what can change the human heart? What can make an impatient, evil, tempestuous man? What can change the human heart? And the answer is nothing but the grace of God. And that change, that transformation of the human heart, that change happens through prayer. It is on our knees, church, in secret communion with God that we find strength to resist temptation, strength to resist and overcome the sins that so easily beset us. It is in prayer that we experience change. And so if we are struggling today, we need to pray. Perhaps, like me, you need more patience. Perhaps you need strength. Perhaps you need grace. Perhaps there are some deep spiritual struggles you cannot share with anyone. Pray. The Bible promises us that Jesus can save to the uttermost those who come to him. So let us come to him in prayer. In 1748, John Newton nearly drowned aboard his slave ship, the Greyhound. It had been battling a fierce storm at sea for several days. The sailors had little hope of survival, but they mechanically worked the pumps, trying to keep the vessel afloat. On the 11th day of the storm, John Newton was so tired he couldn't pump anymore. And so he was tied to the helm and tried to hold the ship to its course. And that night, on that ship, tied to the helm, afraid for his life, fighting for his survival and those of his shipmates, John Newton thought over his life over how his mother had taught him the scriptures at a very young age. And she had prayed that he would become a minister of the gospel. But here he was, captain of a slave ship, a profane, evil man who wanted nothing to do with God. And that night at the helm of that ship, fearing for his life, John Newton's thoughts somehow drifted to God. And he began to pray. He began to pray. And God, God, in his infinite grace, mercy, and wisdom, saved John's life. Not just physically, but spiritual. That night, fearing for his life on that ship, praying and turning to a God who he remembered his mother had spoken about, but who his life had wandered so far away from, John Newton, God worked to change and bring him back to the faith of his childhood. And so he wrote this hymn, Amazing Grace, a testimony of his conversion experience. And we sing this hymn, it's a beloved hymn in the Christian faith, and you understand what inspired the words that he wrote. Amazing Grace, he wrote, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You see why he used that word? He was a wretch and the grace of God reached him. Friends, Prayer ignites change. 
As we come to God in prayer, he will change us. And as God changes us, we can ignite change in the world. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus used two examples to illustrate how he wants his disciples to um, ignite change in the world. And so in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus tells us, you, us, are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, he says, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And then he also says in verse 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, he says, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus asks us to be salt and to be light. Salt, salt adds flavor to food. It brings out the good taste in the food. You want to be careful not to add too much of it, but it brings and adds flavor to the food. Salt can also be used as a preservative to keep things fresh. It can even be used to heal a wound and to prevent infection. Friends, Jesus says we are the salt of the earth. We are called to be salt. We are called to bring a taste and the flavor of God into this world. We are called to bring flavor in the lives of those that we meet, to be agents of healing, agents of change, agents of preservation. We are the salt of the earth. He also says that we are light. Light dispels darkness. Light makes it possible for us to see. When there is light, we can walk clearly and not stumble in the darkness. God's vision is that we ignite change by bringing light into our communities, by helping others to see the way so that they do not stumble in the darkness, by pointing them to him who is the light of the world. Friends, we are called to be light and we are called to be salt. And as we seek to be light and salt in our communities, we can only do that if that change has first been ignited in our hearts and in our lives. David prayed in Psalm 51 verses 10 and 13, create in me a clean heart, O God, he prays, and renew a right spirit within me. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, he says, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. The power of that then. God created me a clean heart, and as you change me, as you renew a right spirit within me, then I will teach transgressors thy ways. As God changes us, and creates the clean hearts in us. By his grace, we can ignite change in our communities, in our church, and in the world. Prayer ignites change. Second thing that prayer ignites in our lives is hope. Prayer ignites hope. We read in Jeremiah 29, verse 11 to 13. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me, he says, and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. It's not a question of will we is he there to be found? He is there and willing and ready to be found. And he says, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. And I am there to give you hope and a future, God says. This message from Jeremiah was one of comfort and reassurance to his people in extreme adversity and despair. 
His nation had just suffered a brutal invasion, and the people were displaced. This picture is no different from our world today. We think of the war in Ukraine. We think of wars in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Gaza. We think of everything that is wrong with our world today. We think about the economic crisis. We think about social political divisions, about natural disasters, extreme poverty, violence. Our world is in a state of despair. And people are looking for hope, even a sliver of hope to grasp. And it seems to many that there is no hope. It's very easy. I don't know if you've been listening to the news lately, church, but as I listen to it, there are days I have to turn it down because I find myself driving, I'm listening to the news, and my, my eyes swell up with tears. Our world is so broken. And we can thank God that in this broken, bruised, battered world, we have hope. We have hope. We have hope. And it is a hope that burns within our hearts. It is hope in Jesus, hope in his soon coming, hope in the better world that is to come. This world is broken, zero doubt about it. But we are not without hope in its brokenness. So when we look at it, when we see pain, we see war, we see sickness, or when we experience trials, tribulations that crush our hearts, we do not despair because we have hope. It is not an ethereal pie in the sky. It's a very real hope. And you know what, friends? It is in prayer that we grasp and hold on to that hope because prayer reminds us that this world is not our home. Prayer reminds us we have a God who walks with us in our times of pain and suffering. Prayer reminds us he has promised not just to walk with us today, but to give us a better world where there is no pain, there is no sickness, there is no death. In prayer, we grasp that hope. We read in Isaiah 41, verse 10, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Count the number of eyes in that verse. This is God speaking. I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you. Friends, the Christian journey in this world, it is tough. But you know what? We never were called to walk in it in our own strength. The Bible says, I will be your strength. So when our strength is failing, as it sometimes will, when it feels like we have cried every last tear we could possibly cry, and our hearts are burdened by sickness, by grief, by sadness that we cannot even share with anyone, when it feels like our strength is failing, God comes in to say, I will uphold you, my child. I will uphold you. He is our strength. And it is on our knees in prayer that we grasp hold of that strength. He says, hold on to me. And I'm sure you can all think back to times in your Christian journey where you look back and you say, I do not know how I found the strength to stand in that time. I remember for me when our oldest son was in the neonatal intensive care unit at just five hours old fighting for his life, had to be revived, went through a severe sepsis that almost took his life, was fighting all of his vital organs being attacked and going through that three months of back and forth and back and forth. You look back and you wonder, where did I find the strength? to keep praying, to keep trusting, to keep knowing that even in this, God is good. Amen. Where did I find that strength? It is only because God says, I will uphold you. 
All of us have an experience like that where God has held us up. And it says, come to me on your knees in prayer. Lay hold of my strength because I will uphold you. Prayer ignites hope. We find that hope on our knees. When Peter was imprisoned for preaching the gospel, the church was in despair. There seemed no hope to get him out of jail. The church came together and prayed, and God heard their prayers, and God sent an angel to walk Peter out of prison. Because the church prayed, Peter walked out of prison. You missed it, church. The church prayed, and Peter walked out of prison. Prayer ignites change. Prayer ignites hope. When the church of God prays, God moves the world. Those prison doors, those guards, everything fell apart because the church prayed. When the church of God prays, God moves the world. And so, friends, Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, everything that was written in the past was written that we might have hope, he says was written to teach us so that through the endurance that is in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. The scriptures were written that we might have hope. The Bible was written that we might have hope. This was written that we might have hope. And he reminds us as well in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. I love, love this verse. Listen to what he says. It is a prayer for me, for us, for our church, our whole community, and those around us. Because the hope that we have is not just for us, it is to be shared with the world. Because we all know people in our communities, our neighborhood, at work, at school, who are struggling as well, and they need to be reminded there is more to life than this broken world. Paul says, may the God of hope, the God of what? The God of hope fill you, he says. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I love that we serve the God of hope. And so may that hope fill us. Fill us with joy. Joy not because we don't have challenges. We do have challenges. We will have trials. We will experience tribulations, but we serve the God of hope. And in prayer, we grasp that hope. Prayer ignites hope. May it ignite hope in our hearts. So we've heard so far that prayer can ignite change. And when there's a change in our heart, there's a hope. A hope that God can help us to move forward. What else can prayer ignite? Forgiveness. Forgiveness is not something that comes naturally to us. So let me ask the question, how many of you have ever been hurt? How many of you have ever been hurt by someone? Really? Fess up. How many of you have ever been hurt? How many of you have allowed that hurt to fester, that you become bitter, resentful? Has it taken a great effort to forgive? I wasn't planning on sharing this story, but I'm going to share it. A few years ago, my family and I, we were invested in another family. We really embraced them and they embraced us. And for a while, it was good. We loved each other, we got along well. And then one day something changed. 
To this day, we have no idea why that change occurred. This family started saying things that really hurt. It hurt because we knew it wasn't true. And there was absolutely nothing we could do to prove otherwise. It took me a long time to get over it because I was doing my Christian duty. I was helping. I was loving. I was being sincere. God is my witness. Sometimes we say things and you don't know the truth, but God knows. And for the longest time I asked why. If I and my family were being so helpful, why did we have to go through this? Why did we have to get our names dragged through the mud? Why couldn't we disprove anything? Why, why, why? And then one day I had to say to the Lord, look, I don't know the reason why, but you have to take this away because it's eating me up. And it's changing me from being a loving person into someone who was harsh and cruel. And I did not like where that was going. You know what? I can't tell you I woke up one morning and poof, it was gone. But every day I prayed that prayer, the hurt became less and less. And now sometimes when it pops into my head, because you can forgive, but sometimes the images don't erase themselves. Till Jesus come, it won't erase. But I don't allow it to affect my behavior. I am wiser in the way I deal with people and with how I let them in my space, but it doesn't stop me from being a loving person. So, what does it mean when Jesus says to us, in his prayer, the Lord's prayer, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors? When we get on our knees and we pray this prayer, what exactly is it you are asking God to do? Have you ever stopped to think, what does that mean? Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. If God forgave us the way we forgive others, hmm, think about that. So I want us to use the analogy of a mortgage. Everyone knows what a mortgage is, right? At least the adults do. If you want a home, usually you don't have that kind of cash lying around. I believe a home can cost anywhere from 500,000 these days and up. You don't have that kind of cash lying around, right? But you need a home. So what do you do? You find a bank who can lend you the money or some lending institution. And usually, you have to sign a lot of papers, a lot of legal, legalese, I would call it. But in that, basically what you're telling the bank is, I want your money to buy a home. And the bank says, sure. I'm going to be your creditor. I'm going to lend you the money. You need to sign all these papers to say that you are the debtor. Now you're indebted to me, and if something should happen, I get the house, because I want my money back. In a nutshell, that's what it is, right? So you sign this agreement, and you promise to pay monthly, semi-month, semi, uh, bi-weekly, however often, and you're paying it back with interest and you're all good. Now you have a landlord called the bank. You can enjoy the house, but really the bank still owes it until you clear this debt off. Sometimes life throws us a curveball. So you get to a point, something happens, and suddenly you cannot pay that debt anymore. What happens? The bank says, okay, I'm gonna write your debt off. Do they? What does the bank say? Give me your house. It becomes mine. And unless you can find someone to step in and say, wait a minute, let them have their house. I will clear the debt. Unless you find that person to bail you out, you become homeless. What has that got to do with Matthew 6, 12? In Psalms 24, verse 1, Jesus says, 
The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Psalms 100 also says, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who had made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Do you see a linkage yet? God made this beautiful world. God says, enjoy it. It's yours. The only thing you have to do is obey my law, trust me, and all is yours. Does God still own this world? Does God own you? Yes, he does. Because if he was to take his breath right now, what do you become? A lump of clay, right? But God is a loving God, so God said, I've given it to you. Just love me, trust me, obey. So in that scenario, God is our creditor because he owns everything. The purchase agreement, trust, obedience, and just follow his law. And a debt. Where did that debt come from? Most of us know the story of Adam and Eve. Do you know what happened? Adam allowed Satan's temptation to get to him. And he sold out the world. So suddenly, a debt was created. Here we have eternal death. What do we do? Who's going to bail us out? Do we have to forfeit eternal life? Someone said Jesus. The solution, John 3, 16. We can read it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't God good? Isn't he grand? God says, I am going to bail you out. I am going to give you Jesus. He is going to be the one who takes care of this eternal death business. So suddenly, as Tando pointed out, we have hope. We allow him to change our heart, we have hope. And suddenly, we are no longer in debt because Jesus gave us his son. He says, now accept. There's no waiting period. If you were to fall on your knees right now and ask for forgiveness and ask for God to come into your heart. He isn't going to say, wait a minute. He says instantly, you're justified. I love you. I've got your back. Just like he did to the tax collector who went down to his house justified. But there's a part of Matthew 6, 12. We've only de dealt with one half. What was the other part of that verse? It says, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. So we've talked about the relationship with us and God, but now we're talking about relationship, me and you. How do I forgive you, your debt against me? So we have already established that the debt is sin. Sin created this problem. And we know that when we receive Christ in our hearts, he has the power to help us forgive. When we recognize, when you look through the cross, when you look at the cross and you know God died for me, he died for you, we're all on the same playing field. Like there's no hierarchy in God's world. We're all sinners. And when we start to look at each other that way and we realize the depth of God's love, he came from heaven. He created us. He knew we were going to nail him to a tree. He knew he had to suffer. We talked about this this week in the adult lesson. He knew he did it out of love. He was bruised. He was beaten. He was rejected for you and me. When we start to understand that we are worth something in God's sight, 
there's a glimmer of that hope that allows us, even though we are beaten up, even though we are hurt, even though we feel as though we're going to be crushed, we realize that God can give us the strength to forgive. The recipe for forgiveness recognizes God's love for us and enables us to love each other. This is something I myself had to come to ter term with in my example I gave you. It hurt, it really hurt. And my family can tell you sometimes, I would just ask why. I would just cry over this thing because I couldn't understand. But when I realize, you know what? There's a devil and this really is about him hurting God because I belong to God. When I recognize God love, when he was on the cross, what did he say? What did he say? Forgive them for they know not what they do. So what is my little hurt? Can you imagine being nailed to a cross? Every time I read this in The Desire of Ages, I get goosebumps because I cannot imagine nails going through my hand, bones crushing, blood oozing. I cannot imagine being beaten with many stripes. Do you know what they beat people with in the Bible times, those Roman beatings? There were metal balls attached to strips of leather. Can you imagine? Can't you feel it just tearing your flesh? And if the Son of God in human form could be on that tree and he could say, forgive them, who am I? What is my puny little problem that I can't forgive? Think about it. Think about that. Ellen White says, we should not think that unless those who have injured us confess the wrong, we are justified in withholding them from our forgiveness. So it doesn't matter if the other party forgives you, has no bearing on whether you forgive. She goes on to say, it is their part, no doubt, to humble their hearts by repentance and confession, but we are to have a spirit of compassion. We need to be compassionate, even to those who hurt us. Towards those who have trespassed against us, whether or not they confess their faults. So what are we called to do? Forgive, regardless of if they confess their sins to you. You must forgive. I started out by saying it's not natural. The natural inclination is to seek revenge. That's our natural inclination. But we need to humble ourselves. We need to allow that change to take place if we are to hold on to that hope. As Christians, we need to learn how to forgive. We need to know how to humble ourselves. We need to understand how to do that. When we look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, it says what? I can do some things. All things through him who gives me what? Strength. What does it say in Romans 12, 21? Do not overcome, do not be overcome by, but overcome evil with. So in other words, even though it's not natural to forgive, I can do all things through Christ. That's the secret, friends. When we experience that change of heart, we have the strength. We can overcome evil with good. What else can prayer ignite? Prayer can ignite unity. What is unity? If I were to ask you to define unity, what is unity? Togetherness. Any other word? One, one, in mind. one in mind. So when I was thinking about this, I came across a devotion by um, Dwight Nelson. Any of you know Dwight Nelson, Pastor Dwight Nelson? 
And his devotion was called come unity. He was playing on the word community. So togetherness is a community. And the scripture reading he based that on was John 7, 11. It says, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me that they may be one as we are one. Are we one? Are, you, are we one? We should be one. So when we talk about unity, we're talking about a coming together, a community of people. And I want you to ask yourself, how many people do I know in church? Can you name 10 people right now? I don't mean by name. To know a name is not to know a person. How many people do you really know? Can you count 10 people who you really know? Then how are we united? How are we a community? Something to ponder. Jesus said, Holy Father, keep through your name those who you have given to me. Has God given you to Jesus? Have you chosen to be long to Jesus? I look around the church. I have the advantage that I can see the panoramic view. And we always say we have many nationalities here. How is it then that we can live together when we come from so many different, different backgrounds? My customs and your customs may be totally different. So how can we live in unity when I am Barbadian by birth, Tando is from Zambia. My friend is from Tanzania. Gislaine is from Haiti. Miriam is from Guadeloupe. How can we live in unity when we have so vast a background? Someone said it. Jesus, because he says we are one. Ellen White says the most powerful and convincing proof to the world of the majesty and virtue of Christ is his power to take away sin. The power of darkness is no match for believers who love one another as Christ have loved them, who refuse to create alienation and strife, who stand together, who are kind, who are courteous and tender-hearted, cherishing the faith that works by love and purifies the soul. In community, that togetherness, there is life. There is power that can be obtained in no other way. So friends, this coming together, this community, only happens through Christ. So, let me ask you the question. Do you always feel as though you're part of the community? You don't have to answer out loud. Ask yourself, do you always feel as though you're part of the community? Do you always feel as part of the community? What helps us come together and feel part of that community? Love love of God, but also, I like to call it neology, pray. Because we said diversity, and sometimes we do rub each other the wrong way because we are different. But if we remember we are part of the same community with the big picture in mind, sometimes we do have to fall to our knees and ask God, to help us remember we are a community. My friends, God's call to community is a powerful one. It is powerful because when we think about each other, 
on the same playing field, no hierarchy. When we remember we're all part of the same family in Christ, that's radical. That's a radical love. To love people who are different, to love people who rub us the wrong way, to love people who don't always agree with us, to love people who sometimes, for peace, we might have to keep a distance. You still have to love because we're all part of the community. Prayer, my friend, is powerful. Prayer can ignite. It ignites change. It ignites hope. It ignites forgiveness. It ignites unity. And in our lives and in our church. So if we are all going towards the same big picture, we need to remember constant prayer is what we need to ignite change in us. And when we have change, there is hope. And when you have hope, you share that hope, you're able to forgive. And once we start forgiving each other, unity becomes possible. Ellen White says, prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse, where are treasured the bungless resources of omnipotence. Friends, there is nothing God cannot do. And even when things may seem bleak, there is hope. There's the power to forgive. Do you desire to let God change you? Do you desire for him to put that hope in your heart? Do you desire for him to give you the power to forgive? Are you willing to commit to him daily? To recommit your lives, to add Jesus for the power to change, to have hope, the power to forgive, and the power to unite. So let's stand.